Outdoor Journal Radio. So how many times have I said this is going to be the best Outdoor Journal Radio podcast episode ever? Hi, everybody. Ever. <laughs> well, cancel all of them because this is going to be the best episode of all time. Epic. I can say uh, uh, if if Sam is our guest is as good as what we think he's going to be, he's going to be good. Mr. Bowman over here, Peter Bone. Perhaps you've heard of him. I, if you haven't, people, uh, I'm going to get Angela pissed Viola. off. Over there, Vova hiding behind the screen. Wave at us. Thank you, Vova. Uh, and Nick is actually here today. Give me a hell yeah! Hell Normally yeah. he just mails it in, right? He just mails in the the the. the he's kind of like the old uh, Willie Nylander. No longer, by the way. No so longer need enter. No longer the old Willie. I, I have to take, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, uh, our very own, the lovely, the talented Dean Taylor. Come on now. On yeah, yeah. Uh, Volvo's got a new technique for everybody listening to, by the way. When Ange gives him some kind of a smart ass thing to say, Volvo starts talking to him in uh, Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Now, so I love that he doesn't it. have to answer. It. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, before we get into that wonderful uh, image of Sam Lowry on the screen, I mentioned Willie Nylander only because Willie, <laughs> I want to, <laughs> yeah, I, I want to take back, I want to eat some crow. I love it. That's so awesome. I don't know what episode it was, but it was at, at uh, what's going call it? Uh, the Lodge 88. I don't know what episode it's called, but it was at Lodge 88 questions and answers. And I said, yeah, that's it, true. It, that, that is true. That is uh, true. whatever well, episode. You, what, you think that I'm lying and these guys are no, going to verify it? I just, it? I just, uh. Yes, I do, actually. Um, uh, on that episode, I was asked who, I don't even know what the question was. Anyways, whatever the episode. Who would you believe you hate the worst, the yeah, most? Yeah, and it was Kessel and Nylander, and uh, I said because they, they don't work, and they don't give you, you know, they don't give you the goods. They're fake, they're phony, they shouldn't be drawing they, a paycheck. I said all those negative things. No, you did, but you did say, one thing you did say is that they have the talent, they just don't want to use it. Yeah, you said. and that's what irks me. I'd rather see somebody without talent work his ass off, her ass off as well, than somebody with talent that just wastes it. And at that time when I said that, uh, unfortunately, Wee Willie was, uh, was doing exactly that. Well, I'll tell you what. He listened to the podcast. He, he well, had to listen to the I podcast. I don't want to say that for sure because I don't know. He says that Angelo guy, I, I, I need to gain his respect. If I was a bet man, I'd say he listens to the podcast. However, I got to tell you right now, I take it all back. Uh, please forgive me, Willie, if you listen to this podcast. Uh, I think you're the best <laughs> hockey player in the National Hockey League right now. I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's true. What's his stats like versus uh, oh, he's McDavid's in the top, to everybody? He's in the top, oh, McDavid, forget it. Okay, Mc, but everybody. McCo? Okay, Sydney. I no. saw Sydney had a good game the other night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, Willie's in the top five in, in points. Don't downplay McDavid, okay? I don't care what you say. If he's in a little slump, he's still. A little you, slump? Uh, you see what you're doing there? Now you're facetious bastard. No, he's the greatest player in the in the world, obviously, right. but he's not doing right. well right now. Right. He'll so. get out of it. Yes, he will. He'll get out of it. But anyways, I just wanted to publicly apologize to you, Willie. If we, you Willie Wanker, went to down, inside, outside, I'm upside down. I'm a big down. Nylander fan now. Wow. There. there. I said it. I Did feel anybody better. Ever think I feel that, better. Hey, Dean, do you ever think you heard that right there? I, I kind of had an idea it was coming. <laughs> He's, he's I gotta be good. honest with you. I gotta be. I feel better. He's, what about you? Didn't answer my question. How is he sitting in the rankings of players? I told you he's in the top. top he has five. a point every game. Every this, game. No, this no. Year. But is he is he fifth? Like is yeah, that yeah. what he is? Fifth. Right yeah, yeah. Wow. He's in top five uh, in every category. Good. Good. Uh, the only thing he's not in top five for, I think, is hitting. He's got to be but, number but, one in but, hair. Is he not like the number oh, one in hair? Do he's up there for sure in hair? Yeah. Can yeah. you imagine being him right now? Can you imagine being him? He's sitting on the. The cusp of signing, I think, right now, if I were a betting man, I would say his next contract is going to be bigger than Austin Matthews. It might be bigger than uh, well, so, McDavid. Am, so I, am I right? 13 is Austin and McDavid right, right now. A year from now, which is when he's going to sign his next contract. When the cap goes up. Cap's yeah, going up. Know. He's going to be. Yeah. He's going to be See, a forty-five. The greater part of a plan. Forty-five. Way to go, goal Nylander. Score. That was a plan. See, he did that purposefully, and then Angelo called well, him out, and then and now all of a sudden, I'm going to be a fourteen and a half million guy, a uh, million a year. Can you imagine looking like that and having 
an eight-year, $14.5 million contract in your back pocket. Hello, I ladies. About, I don't care about the money. I just want to look like that. I don't give a shit. <laughs> oh, my. Anyways, uh, just want to uh, reach out to him in case he does listen. Anybody that knows him, tell him. Tell him to tune in. Listen to him. I think he's podcast. the best. Just I don't one. care what the, the rest of them say about you. I think you're wonderful. What yeah. a show. What a show. What is this the episode or is this the episode? Uh, A little later on, we're going to be joined by uh, this uh, good-looking young man, Sam Elliott Lookalike. Uh, His name is Sam Lowry. He is a former uh, conservation officer in both Arizona, state of Arizona, and then finished off his career in Montana. Spent 41 years in law enforcement in the outback. He wrote a book that uh, is the main reason he's on with us today. It's a fascinating read. Uh, You will, uh, hopefully, he'll share some of those stories with us. If we do our job properly, we'll prompt him enough to to give us some insight. But it's called the, um, an Arizona game ranger remembering the outlaws. The and the, the good book. part about the book is it's just stories. Pretty much, it's just oh based on uh, you know a, a section of stories, which is so relatable for uh, especially for people in the yep. outdoors. So that's so cool. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, can't wait to talk to him. Uh, before we get to that, I want to remind everybody, by the way, in case you, for those of you who don't know, uh, you could be watching us right now. You can be watching. Come on, this now. Very, I'm telling on, you. Now. I'm wow. telling you. Uh, you could be watching this very hey, maybe program. Maybe they won't watch us because we're not as good looking as Kneelander. They probably, they might. Hey, these but they don't know that us. unless they watch us. Then, then they'll, yeah, they'll find we'll out. We'll get one episode then, I guess. Well, maybe we'll get one episode. Maybe this will be the episode. Who knows? Uh, we are now featured, available, uh, up for display on uh, YouTube. Come on, On now. the Fishing Canada YouTube channel. Wow. No, now, okay, so why are we on the Fishing Canada YouTube channel when this is called Outdoor Journal Radio that's where Podcast. The Fish Canada guys. And we built an audience there. All of our people live there. Yes, all of our and people. And you don't live think there. we could have just transitioned everybody over to People don't transition very, easy. Yeah, very difficult in this They're day stubborn. and age. Very difficult. Hmm. The YouTube world. All right. Well, anyway, you can go to YouTube. Hard enough but, time getting our. What's our numbers? What's our subscribers on YouTube, pro- approximately? Oh. 20, 20, Nick's the man for that. Nick, hang on. He's Please checking hold. that. That's why Please he's hold. here. 30 today. something. 30 something 30 thousand? Something? That'd be yeah. nice if it was 30 something. Yeah. I thought it was 20 something last time I looked, but. He's looking, look, he's holding his Boba finger up. Boba looks disgusted. He's over there with his head down. Saying, oh, what he the doesn't hell? Get on with the show so I can go for lunch. He's in the Ukraine 20, right now one, doing the uh, sugar uh, girl dances 30, or something. 30,000? One, two, one, 21,000. There you go. 21,000. He this? was being. What is this? He can't. Sign language. Oh. Anyways, uh, for those of you interested, you can go to YouTube right now as we speak and watch this uh, presentation nice. live, uh, so nice. to speak, in, nice. but in living color. Yeah. And, and, and if talking. you do that, you'll notice that I'm wearing one of our beautiful Outdoor Journal hoodies that are available on uh, Hello. shop at fishingcanada.com, along with uh, all of the other paraphernalia that you see on hey, the screen hey, and a whole that, bunch more. See that shirt right there? All available. There. That shirt right there. Yeah, I like that. I'm shirt. working on a hat like that. I'm Why working on. I'm working on a design. Oh, nice. I, think, I showed Dean, and Dean likes it a lot. Well, if Dean likes he it, he thinks then it's, it's going to be like our best seller. Yeah, I well, do. if he likes it, then why? So just do. A, I'm going to send like you it. my mock-ups very soon. Please. And uh, I didn't realize that we were uh, doing that kind of stuff. Why? Well, why not? This is I'm just the, asking. Part of the business. Uh, but part right? of the business. I agree. Yeah. So you're. Gotta so now you're money. into uh, what do they call that department? A fashionista. The fashionista. The fashionista. Yeah. Thank you. A cigar aficionado and a fashionista. Wouldn't that go good right about now? Oh, my. I had um, a cigar on the weekend. I had one yeah. in my garage. Did you? Yeah. I've been, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not doing enough of it. Well, no, you probably are. To, you I probably are doing it. enough of it. You, I'm not. You don't need to I'm force not. the issue in the wintertime when you go out to the garage to have a cigar. It's probably an issue there. Anyways. <laughs> you think about uh, the Sam Elliott lookalike. Sam Lowry will join us later on. He's going to share some of his insane stories as he uh, immerses himself into the underbelly of the poaching and and illegal activities that are taking place in our outdoors. And yes. Shares them with you, uh, as I said, some via his book. I got can I can I take a little bit of time as extra as a non scheduled part of this? Sure, please. Okay, so. Did I, people, did I mention this, by the people way? People think that Angie and I have the nicest life, and everything goes perfect and all. And we do. We have a good gig, but I'm going to tell them about part. our Sault Ste. Marie trip. So, oh so boy. in a nutshell, we have a, we have a Porter flight to go from 
Toronto Islands. To Porter Airline. Now, we didn't have a porter. He makes it sound like we can porter afford a porter. Uh, out to Toronto to Sault Ste. Marie. Instead of driving for seven hours, right? So our first thought was we got to go from Oshawa to the Porter to the Toronto Islands. It's going to take, we don't know which road to take. At what time of day? It's, well, the flight's at 10.15. So right. we, we had to, wheels up at 6.30 is what we're saying from here to a 10.15 flight. Okay, answer's a little late. He was 10.40, but he was still there. Anyways, it took us almost three hours to drive in to, from, uh, from Oshawa to Toronto. Uh, we were just got on time. Ants checks in, gives his ID, gives the bag. I give them my ID. And all of a sudden, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Mr. Bowman, uh, your driver's license has expired. <laughs> Well, if, I don't know how this works, but I know my birthday's in June, and I think you get it on your birthday, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe you don't. But I, I, I might. think sometime before your birthday, otherwise you'd be going around with <laughs> so I, I'm assuming they so, give it to you, they let you know a month or two before it's expiring. They're supposed to, yeah. yeah. They're Which in your to. case would make it say, let's say April. April. Yeah, May, maybe. You know, 30 day or whatever. Right. Okay. So anyways, in your driver's license is expired. And Ange looks at me like, you idiot. And I look at me like, you idiot. Okay, give me, uh, if you got your health, uh, health card, because everybody else had. Here, sir. Here you go, ma'am. Uh, sorry, sir. That's expired as well. <laughs> so I got two expired cards. Uh, and the flight is taken off. Yeah, like they're Ange, calling last call. And just giving me the keys to the truck. He says, here, drive back to the office and pick me up on Friday, you idiot. I don't know why. I went through my wallet and I pulled out my FAC. And, I got, and it's got a picture on it. And it's a federal card. My firearms acquisition certificate or PAL or whatever you want to call them. They didn't even know if they had to accept that because they haven't they seen one in so long. They had to go check with about three people and they've changed and all that. So, boom, I get on the flight. Beautiful. We get up there, Sault Ste. Marie. Okay. What a so, mess. What so a mess. with all that crap... <laughs> We were supposed to have supper on the train. Remember that? We were supposed oh to have supper on the train. God. Ended up with little hors d'oeuvres. That was not that we all went out and had well, a cigar. No, no, was, the train. Where did the train come from? We were on a plane. But what he say, he say part of uh, the reason we were going up there is that uh, there was this big uh, tourism gala tourism gala. And, and, and that night, uh, we were going to be fed uh, via this um, train. A, a set of tr a rail yeah, cars. The old Algoma train. And each, and each one of the cars was going to be featuring a different food. So we, thought, we wow, assume, five holy cars, mackerel. We're going to be full. We're going to be, by the time we get off that puppy and hit the caboose, they're going to have to. <laughs> we're going to look gonna like a caboose. We're waddle back to the hotel, right? Anyways. That was a disaster. That was disaster. not the case. That was a disaster. We don't even get into that. Next but day. It was a disaster. And we all do our things like that. Ange gets sick for the gala. So we have a gala as at the very end. As a dog. End. Sick as a dog. Has to poo-poo a lot. <laughs> as a <laughs> he dog. He calls me up. He says, Peter, I don't think I can make it. You have to go to the gala on your own. So I go to the gala on my own. Ange is at the back. Sick, sick, sick. We got to leave the next morning. Flight's at seven something. We get up at five o'clock. And just when we're about to, you came to my door, my hotel sure. room door. I, I had already packed my luggage in the, in the, in the car. I got, Ange, I got a text. Right, your plane has been delayed from 7.30 to one o'clock. We could have slept. <laughs> then I get a could've text about two hours after that. So now we don't know what to do. Your plane has been delayed till two o'clock. And another one after that. But I got to bring plane. the car rental back for, yeah, yeah. for, for eight o'clock. Yeah. So we had to deal with that. And then the plane was at 2.30. And finally the plane oh, left about God, three, three ish, something like that. But that's not, that even. <laughs> I thought Air Canada was the only f company that calls itself an airline that was allowed to screw up their schedule every day, every flight. I thought they were the only ones. Apparently not. Apparently, Porter is now called Air Canada Light because they, too, have uh, assumed the responsibility of screwing up and uh, just saying, oh, well, hey. Yeah, whatever. What are you, you going to do? So the end of the story, just to let everybody know, this was the, the piece de resistance. So we just get off the plane at Porter, and we're just about to get on the ferry boat. And I get a text from Nick. It says, the dead fish you left in your oh. damn truck has stunk the office oh. since you left. We just found it. I hate it. So, I hate it here. <laughs> so, so when we left three days earlier for the airport, Pete decided he wanted his truck indoors. He didn't want to leave it outside for whatever reason. Normally, he just leaves it outside. But this time, he thought no, he'd no, be no. special. Usually, my wife takes it he home put for it, me. Uh, he wanted to put it indoors. We have a beautiful uh, three-bay garage connected to the studio. 
And so, yeah, put it indoors. What do you want me to tell you? So he puts it indoors. Well, earlier uh, during my, when I was convalescing, being ill up in the Sioux, my wife uh, sends me a message, says there's something that died in this <laughs> building. I'm going to have to call an exterminator and or some kind of forensic uh, outfit that can find it because we've tried everything. We've turned the building upside down. And we can't find it, but man, something is dead and dead, dead, dead. And that's when we received news the next day from Nick that, in fact, it was Peter's truck. It was deep. Mr. Dean knows the smell of dead fish, so Dean figured it out. I, mean, he's, I spotted he, it. And he spotted it, did went you? to my truck and all <laughs> yeah, that stuff. I found it. So yeah. what I had done, just to let everybody know, is we have a big garbage bin out here. And when I have fish guts, when I clean a fish, and I caught a pike previous not i don't even know how long how long was that in there a week i think probably the weekend do you not smell it like when you're no because it's outside in my driveway but doesn't it permeate like the cabin no no it's outside my driveway these these temperatures are are to the point where it's not rotting yet right these temperatures outside but when i put it inside totally forgetting to dump it in the bin that's when the problem was. I mean, that heated room in there. And <laughs> I, got, I got back and I thought, I, I am, Monique is going to cut my nuts off. I yeah, guarantee you. She should have. Oh, my God. What a freaking idiot. You didn't. So. If it had been me, I wouldn't be here right now to tell that story. Oh, that's whatever. all I know for sure. Poor, but not we Petey, because remember, he's benevolent. He's a, a I love you, Monique. Franciscan monk. I love you, Monique. I, I, you have to put up with this shit every day of your life. You have to be loved by many. Uh, winter all. sale going on. On by the way, it was uh, it was uh, f- the boys fixed it up, put it put the dump in the, the bin. And and I took the truck fine. to the car wash on the we, weekend. We all lived happily <laughs> after. <laughs> Uh, winter sale going on as we speak on fishingcanada.com or store.fishingcanada.com, whichever way you want to enter, either the front shop door, or the back door, shop, whatever you want. Come it on. doesn't matter. Come on now. Come on now. No wonder she doesn't what, are you on you. strike today? Making notes. You're making notes? <laughs> oh, man, are we in trouble. Uh, so, yeah, winter sale going on now. All kinds of goodies. Don't miss it. It is there. It's there for you. It is the only reason it's there is for you. It ain't for him, although he's wearing one. It ain't for me, although, by the way, what do you think of that beauty? Yeah. Ooh, thank, thank you. you. I got that one now. Yes, wow. guy. Wow, I love those. The, were those the best The best movies of all time? Would you rank Clint Eastwood them in the Dusters. They were the best. Oh, man, I want to watch one The Good, right the Bad, now. the Ugly, which is that <gasps> one. Um, a Fistful of Dollars? Oh, that was oh, a good one. Oh, my God. Even few- the funny ones, like, Two Mules for Sister Sarah. You remember that, that was, one? That was okay. But that was different. different it was a, but yeah. it was so funny. Even the funny ones were, uh, were uh, awesome. Uh, a few dollars more. Uh, high high plains, plains Drifter. Drifter. Oh, my. How good was that? That was a goodie. That was a goodie. Anyways, uh, winter sale. Fishingcanada.com. Uh, uh, be there. Be square. Whatever they say. Don't, uh, don't you dare miss it. Uh, listener feedback, my friend. Yeah, man. Comment from at Mitch5538 via YouTube. Uh, this is from the Eric Lindros episode. Oh, that's why I was going to say, what's uh, the Doomer looking at? Way ahead of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dean. See, that's what he makes notes for right there. So he can oh, ahead. okay. Right? So, as an American, this uh, Mitch says, uh, as an American, I appreciate your show. Thank you, Mitch. You guys teach people to be responsible fishermen. Here in the U.S., some spots that were fantastic just eight years ago are nothing what they were. I love smallmouth fishing. And they're all... Uh, and, there are also many issues that need discussion from someone with a platform to do so. I think the biggest contributor to the downward trend in numbers and average size is the huge amount of live well tournaments. The process of stuffing five trophy 10-year-old plus fish in a box, bouncing them around the lake, parading them around through the way and then releasing the survivors miles away from their original refuge causes tremendous fish death and is like putting the ecosystem in a blender. 200 boats, all with with fish in the well, displacing them, it's a blender, and someone should be, should advocate these MLF, or should advocate the MLF method of catch and immediate release. I love fishing, and I fear uh, that ecosystems will be like 10 to 20 years down the road if nothing else changes. So you worry about what's going to happen 10 or 20 yeah. years down the road. Well, a couple the MLF of things. method is a, is a good one for those that don't know. Uh, very quick story, but they just well, they catch you, the you fish, you can interrupt me. the it's fish, better, right? and then drop them right back as immediate release. Used to that. So, so we've gone full circle because I'm listening as you're reading that. I'm listening. Wow, 
Who would have thought here we are some 35, 40 years later uh, listening to this person tell us that live well tournaments should be banned when, you know, 35, 40 years ago we were advocating for live wells to be standard equipment on a, on a boat, on a fishing boat of true, all things. True, yeah. Because up until that point we were using uh, coolers with mm-hmm. little aerators, right? Yeah. And uh, so then every boat on the planet starts developing live well technology. Every boat has live wells. Everybody's happy. We're all running around tournament fishing. And and look at me with my wonderful uh, recirculating live wells. And uh, everything is good. And here we are now uh, saying we need to ban live well tournaments by the sounds of it. Well, but, you know, during yes. that whole process... During that whole process, the last four decades or so, we've asked ourselves, and we have been asked, both ourselves asking and others asking, are we sure that this tournament fishing where we're displacing four or 500 fish every Saturday on a particular body of water, yes, yes, they're being released. Yes, the tournament organizers... um, grew through this evolution to make sure that they managed, handled, and released these fish in in as good a shape as they could. Yes, yes, and yes, but, you know, you can't deny the fact that we were removing these fish from where they were this morning at 8 o'clock to, I don't know, in some cases 20, 30 miles away and dumping them in different conditions, water temperature, water clarity, uh, weeds, food, uh, that whole thing. They just went from boom, boom, boom. And in between, this guy's pretty accurate. He's saying it's like putting them in a blender minus the blades and uh, scrambling their brains a little bit, you know. And how many fish did we actually kill during that whole process? And people don't That's realize that that this blender he's talking about is, we all think it's just... Uh, traveling from point A to point B, but you don't realize that there's three foot waves that are crushing in from every direction and that boat is just pounding all the way back, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, there are bad days. I mean, on those calm days, which there are some calm days, it's probably not near as much, but the blast with the blender he's talking about, I think anyways, right? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty much a- I think temperature change is probably a lot more critical than we like to think it is or give credit to. Uh, temperature change, oxygen level changes, the close proximity, the confinement in a small area of, as as this uh, gentleman says, you know, uh, five big fish all pushed together in a box, bouncing around. That whole thing has got to be a, a bit of yeah. trauma as well. Yeah, yeah. And listen, I'm not, I'm not saying from one minute here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that tournament fishing is wrong. I'm not saying that live wells are wrong. I'm not saying any of the above. But this this certainly should open our eyes. This comment um, is very interesting. He's not the only one, I'm sure, that's thinking that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's something that we should. The MLF, obviously, they... they, But don't they still weigh a fish in or something during the process? Um, I'm not sure of the most current. I know they've gone back... To a, so they went to a five fish limit thing, and now they're back to unlimited, and that's raising a bunch of concerns too. Guys don't like it. A lot of people don't like it, but um, I don't know. I think they're all in boat for the major for the big okay. event. I think they are all in boat. They have you got to remember. There's this bunch so, of series: the Toyota series, the there's a Pro League or whatever they call it. I can't remember what the other ones is. So there's a bunch of different series all the way down. But I think the big one is is on the water, which is the one that's televised and showing people. Right. So this guy sees this and says, hey, that's a great way of doing it. And it is a great way of doing it. At some point, though, you know, let's uh, sort of roll forward in the time machine, maybe 10 years down the road. There may be a, a, a message similar to this one, except now it speaks to instant live release tournaments and the fact that it's doing damage to fish just by yeah. making contact with them. Yeah. So, like, where do you yeah. draw the line? Yeah. Uh, there's a, a wonderful old dear friend of mine um, who I've interviewed several times on the, on the Outdoor Journal Radio Prime. I think we've had her here on the podcast, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Catherine Maroon. Um, she used to be host of the What a Catch television Good fishing memory, program. Good memory, buddy. Good memory. 
No, I'm serious. I got to pat you on the back for that one. You know, yeah, that was can't, good. You I had, didn't remember that. Because and, and to everybody listening, he's a very much a victim of CRS. So, and, and unfortunately, if you don't know what that means, it's can't remember shit. Just so he's he's got that disease. I heavy. could remember Catherine for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that she had Lyme disease. She was All my right. very first Lyme disease uh, uh, interview mm-hmm. back uh, 20 some odd years ago. Anyways, the reason I bring her up is because the last time. I interviewed her. She's now talking to me about about she loves fishing. She still fishes uh, as as often as she can with no hooks. <laughs> and she's gone into she has a name for it, Peter. She has a name yeah, for it. It's called Kukuribu to the Kapusta. Oh, see, see, she she just loves the everything about the fish catching process except hooking the fish up. So all she needs to do is is make contact with fish, and, and that's that's her thing. Who's to say that after a decade of MLF type tournament fishing, that somebody is going to come up with something similar to that? You know, it's all cyclical, right? Who so, knows? So it's we got be a tournament site fishing tournament where I saw one. I get exactly. away. Exactly. I was it's close to a five pounder. Exactly. Yeah, on, the, on the honor basis, right? I mean, we thought. We thought live wells were going to be the next big thing. We thought that's it. We've hit it. We're at the pinnacle of, well, we of, kind of, of fish it. management with the live time, wells. For sure at the time we did. Right. It, so who knows? Please don't mistake, though. The, the tournament anglers, it's in their best interest to keep their fish as perfect as possible. So the, the anglers themselves, these tournament guys that are, they want to get that fish from point A to point B. They know what they're up against from Kingston to Belleville, and they got to go through Lake Ontario and all that stuff. So they're working their asses off at keeping their fish alive because they will lose weight, which loses money. So so they do. Don't, they, also not love, they also love the fishery. They also are, they are love great the fishery as well. conservationists. Yeah, Most tournament anglers, that conservation is at the top of the list. yeah. yeah. Just, I just want to give the props out to the to the tournament <coughs> anglers because they deserve it. So, anyway. anyways, uh, interesting, interesting uh, yeah. observation that was all posted on the YouTube version of this show, right? What the hell Am I right? Here? Well, it looks well, like we, it. we via the YouTube, YouTube right? Yeah. It says Mitch uh, C five five three eight via YouTube on the Eric Lindros Love episode. It. Yes, sir. That's right. Now that's uh, that's good. So we have another source of uh, gathering. Uh, stuff like that. And I love it, man. It just keeps keeps growing. Speaking of keeping growing, uh, the podcast network is on a, on a tear. Uh, the, boys. the boys. The boys. Right there. Uh, them are the Ugly Pike podcast boys that you see behind us, or at least that's their, that's their episode um, featuring uh, Chris and Frank as the hosts. These are two f- real fanatical musky anglers i know it's called the ugly pike but believe me they're all about a musky well they're now uh, honored to, to bring on a new sponsor to that podcast uh, show uh, called ezoko and apparently it's canada's premier pike and musky shop i say apparently i mean that i mean that's but um according to uh, everything that we've been able to see it might even be the only shop in all of canada that specializes and is only uh making musky and pike gear available i went went online and looked at them today it's a nice looking uh, everything about it very good their online presence is really good nice they're their inventory is insane because you know you know yourself with all that stuff that the you know there's mm. the sky's the limit of oh my that God. craziness of these big giant baits and all that. And they're there's based, more and uh, more baits uh, for musky that are being designed oh yeah, and built. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're based out of very close to uh, well they're on Montreal Island so I think it's, oh, I don't wow. know if you call it Montreal there but they're very close to Montreal which is yeah. a fantastic musky area right no there and there so oh. um, yeah check them out. I think it might be the most underrated musky fishery in North America. I'll be honest with you. Oh, yeah. uh, we don't hear a lot about it but you and i both have had personal experiences there to know that there are gigantic musky i think a lot of part. the the guides especially there keep it quiet yeah maybe that's it they're all maybe booked up it. they got a full booking of uh, all year long yeah, so true. why you know why tell everybody <laughs> uh anyways uh Azoko, uh, canada now presents uh the ugly pike podcast and the episode we wanted to highlight real quick is episode 153 which i believe you're seeing on the screen right now for the, all of those folks who went over to youtube to watch us live you actually have it up on the screen because it features a good friend of ours who has been on our show several times uh dr stephen cook 
And uh, he talks about, with, and it must have freaked these guys out, right, to have Dr. Cook come on their show and talk about moon phases. Because musky anglers are all about the moon, oh, the salooner tables, the max, the primary, the lesser. Like, they got this whole the majors, and majors minors. minors, all that stuff, right? And um, if uh, Dr. Cook gave them the goods like he did on our uh, show, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, those yeah. boys got freaked out real yeah. bad. But you might want to listen. Rather than us uh, give it away, go check it out. It's episode 153 and 54. Apparently, it was a two-parter with Dr. Cook. Uh, you want to you wanna maybe maybe go there and listen to this one. It's a good one. I like that winter biology stuff, too. That's kind of stuff that you don't ever think about. You know, yeah, even when the, in the off-season of the fishing and just learning about the fish itself. So. Uh, in the news on FishingCanada.com, uh, this one just keeps rearing its ugly head. It will not go away. What a dickhead. Look at him. He's just, he just looks like that. a dickhead. You can't say that. I can't? No. What a knob. What no, a... That's better. All right. Uh, in the news uh, is this one. Uh, infamous walleye cheater. That's the guy right there. Chase Kaminsky. Right there. In case you want to know his name, Chase Kaminsky. Uh, he was the one along with a partner. Now, I guess the partner is not involved in this one, but anyways, they uh, cheated in that big walleye series uh, and the tournament of it, which was eventually held on Lake Erie. And, uh, they were almost, they're lucky they got out of there without being lynched because it looked like a bit of a mob scene when they, he ran, well, he, that guy he ran, ran, he ran yeah. to the truck and locked the doors. And his well, partner took it all, took all the shit. As you're going to find out a little later on, on the program with our special guest, uh, as we mentioned, the CEO officer, CO officer, um, from, um, Arizona and, uh, Montana. A lot of these guys are, uh, career criminals. So what I mean by that is uh, not all poachers, but but most poachers are just criminals. And a criminal is a criminal is a criminal. And this guy showed his true colors because he now stands accused of deer poaching. So it wasn't enough that he committed a crime uh, in the walleye uh, world, but now he's moved because he got caught by the way, what did he end up getting? Do you remember what he got for this? It, it was a federal. Uh, yeah. Anybody know what happened on that? Yeah, they lost oh. their licenses in Pennsylvania. I know that. Yeah, big deal. I think they p- might have paid. They lost their eighty thousand dollar boat. I know yeah, that. they had to pay like twenty thousand dollars in fines or the equivalent in volunteer. Okay, or work they or something some, like that. So they got a bit of a wake up call, anyway. Yeah. Right. Anyways, that wasn't enough. No. It wasn't enough. They said, hey, I need to get some attention in the hunting field now. I've done the fishing. Now let me move my focus to hunting. And uh, went out and started poaching white tail, white tail deer, bucks. Somebody accused uh, him of it. So somebody that knew him, yeah. um, knew Kaminsky, they reported he killed a number of white tail deer bucks uh, all while hunting out of season after legal shooting hours and without a license. So, good guy. Good uh, conservation the, guy right there. The wardens who followed him um, found five. Now, they call, they're call they still calling him the accused because these charges have not been tried in a court of law yet. Uh, so, up until now, we can only call him the accused. But uh, <laughs> apparently, they found five mounted bucks uh, in his possession. And they are thinking that uh, they were shot at night during non-hunting season for these animals. Yeah, good guy. Really good guy. Unbelievable. Now, we're we're reporting on what he's been caught for. Duh. Most of it has This guy's been doing his whole life. Let's let's be honest. Those are five whitetails probably in the last year. He probably does five whitetails a year. He does uh, all kinds of walleye uh, infractions. He does bass. I guarantee you this guy is just a lifer. As my wife would call him, frequent flyer into the the system. You know what I mean? Criminal. Criminal. Career career criminal. Yep. And I'm sure he also uh, shoplifts at the local uh, 7-Eleven too. Yeah, he probably does. He had, uh, there was some other stuff uh, that's moved on. We'll go, we don't need to do all this stuff. No, but it's all there at Fishing Canada. In October 22, Comiskey was charged with stalking and harassing a woman after he allegedly sent her harassing text message and followed her. Um, and then uh, in February, Chase Kaminsky, along with Caden Kaminsky, his 18-year-old <laughs> son, were charged with conspiracy, conspiracy to commit forgery and related charges after they passed fake $100 bills in a bowling alley. 
I told you he was a dickhead. Uh, Sam's going to share his uh, personal experiences coming up here very shortly uh, with uh, criminal uh, career criminals like this. I'm going to ask Sam about that uh, the night. Uh, how did they know he shot them at night? You know what I mean? I have to yeah, ask him that yeah, question. Good question. All right, this week's fan question. Speaking, Speaking of, of questions, questions <laughs> submitted oh, by Kyle oh. Benning of uh, Iowa. Now, is it a coincidence that, because uh, I know Dean... Uh, reaches into the 45 gallon drum and pulls these out so randomly. Luck, right? Is it a coincidence that uh, all of the. This uh, whole show, except for you and this I. This whole show is all American. Yeah. Which is fine. I'm not suggesting that's a bad thing. Fan but uh, question Kyle Benning is from Iowa. We, we love our American audience. We do. We They've do. They've been writing in a lot. They've, uh, well, you know we what? Do, that's a good I'm thing. Yeah. I love it. I think it's yeah, fantastic. But, so they're all in one drum then. You don't have a separate drum for U.S. Uh, no, I, I mix them all in. Good for you. It's a North American drum. Oh, good for you. Yeah. God bless you. Are we going to spread out of North God America? Do we have uh, anything else? Is there anybody that's listening from... An international drum? Yeah, yeah. Do we have we that? We can talk about that. Okay. Right. I'd like to see yeah. a, like a question from Japan or something like that. That'd be, so, that'd be awesome. Kyle Benning from, from Iowa. <laughs> Boy, this group would get off track pretty quick, it? <laughs> that's what it's all about, buddy. That's what podcasts uh, are all about right now. Via there. email. Uh, submits this week's question. Um, he sent it to info at fishincanada.com. That's where you, too, can submit a question. And perhaps if your uh, moons and planets all align, Dean, when he reaches down into his 45-gallon drum, may pull your question out. Come and on now. We may be talking about you here next. Mm-hmm. But if you don't submit a question, it ain't going to happen for sure. Uh, Kyle Benning from Iowa wants to know or states i recently bought a fishing kayak to a better access my local river for fishing the water levels are so low this year in iowa due to the drought uh, which makes boat access extremely difficult that's the beauty of kayaks right you can put them in just about anywhere give me a hell yeah Give me a hell yeah! Thank you. That's right. Uh, My current life jacket is a little bulky for wearing while paddling and fishing out of a uh, tighter space. Any life jacket recommendations for someone wanting to put safety first on the water without sacrificing mobility or comfort when fishing out of a kayak? So... My initial response would be to wear one of the wonderful inflatables that uh, are all the rage right now, either manual or automatic. However, that would be my uneducated answer to you. But uh, I will tell you that a better option than that are the actual kayak-specific life jackets that are available on the market now. Hey, I'm wondering if he doesn't have one. Obviously, Kyle doesn't have one. Obviously, he doesn't have one. These things are wonderful. I mean, you know how comfortable our inflatables are. They're very open. Well, the, everything's open on these. Yeah, talking, right? they're just incredible. They, they're not bulky. Uh, you have total movement in these things. Total movement. They're short, so you don't have that problem of a long life jacket, which you would even have with some of the inflatables. They're designed to sit up high. Gives you yeah, full so you're movement. Sitting, yeah, you're always sitting, yeah. right? You've got full of movement of your torso. They are absolutely wonderful. Some of them come with little pockets and stuff that you can further uh, utilize because in a kayak, you're you're kind of restricted for places to put stuff, especially small little things. Well, these things come uh, complete with little pockets and pouches that you can use. Fully adjustable. So, you know, whether you're six foot five, 300 pounds or... Or, uh, or me. <clears throat> Short little, you know. Uh, 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 you can have to way, say it that way. Tubby. These things are. Oh, thank you. These things are fully adjustable, and so it, they're infinitely adjustable, which means. So, uh, have you tried one on? Oh, I used when to sell, you sell them. them. I used so, to they're, sell are they that comfortable? Like they really are. Oh my god, they are incredible for kayaking. Yeah, yeah. I would not recommend them for boating. For anything else, I would yeah. not recommend them for walking around. You know, like we do in FNC one with yeah. with our jackets. Uh, I would not recommend it for that, but for for paddling a kayak and being able to still cast sitting down, there is nothing, nothing better. So that's what I'd recommend. Because I, I looked into the go back to the uh, inflatables, yeah. and I tried looking this up, and I, the only answer I could get is that in whitewater kayaking, it's illegal. It's totally. Use an inflatable. Totally. You can't use it. So I don't know about just regular kayaking. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. I didn't find anything That's about that. That's a really good point he makes. And you know? something else that should be taken into Thank account. Thank you, Angelo. If you are going to use the inflatables, 
Uh, kayaking is probably the one vessel where I would recommend that you get the automatic. Oh yeah. As opposed to manual inflate. Uh, you because, really should get the automatic because there is the a time. risk in a, in a kayak of, of always being, you know, tipping. And if, especially if it's not a sit on top of kayak, if you're sitting in the kayak, yeah, you yeah. generally tend when you tip to, yep. to go completely under. And that's when your head might come in contact with a rock. It, that would mean you're not wearing a helmet, which would be stupid anyways. But if you're not, that's when you could get knocked out. And if you have a manual inflate a life jacket on, it's like not wearing one. That's why maybe I think... In kayaks, maybe it does have to be an automatic. Yeah. Period. What if what if they were stuck in the kayak though? If they got somehow got wedged in there and the thing popped up, but you couldn't get out because your life jacket blew up in there. That's a great question. I don't know how to answer that one. That's uh, if you had have given me some advance notice, I might have this been able we're to do very some, organic some here, research. Angela. We're very organic. We 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 bring problems out, and if we can't I, answer them, we'll get somebody I, else to write in. And, I uh, don't know, and I also wonder how many jurisdictions there are that make helmet wearing on a kayak mandatory. Well, not it's, not fishing kayaks. You never see guys. I mean, I'm watching a lot of these guys lately doing that, and they're never, they don't wear helmets. The only the whitewater kayakers that I know of wear helmets. Wow. So the fishing guys, they got fishing hats on fishing Canada hats there you saw them perhaps you heard of them 20 bucks <laughs> 20 bucks a pop <laughs> winter sale I don't on know. right now it's something we should look into so that we're not uh, I'm gonna get set. I'm gonna look into it one day because I'm gonna buy a fishing kayak are you I, I my retirement is gonna be part of when I'm getting nice and you know out of the, age the, and, pa- the pedal ones yeah I think so or whatever <gasps> I yeah, love the pedal those. ones I would think I so at least that those. or maybe an electric motor one because I'm gonna be getting old obviously but yeah but, I think oh, it'd be so cool for you it'd be perfect because you get all that nice yeah, exercise hell yeah work out, you know damn right and, be, and get into those lakes that nobody else can get into yeah. Hello. I often wonder with kayakers that fish, though, <laughs> because they are there. I don't even know. Maybe they don't tip. Maybe they're not as tippy as I'm making them sound to be. Um, but how do you take care of all of the stuff on your kayak if it? Well, if, they don't if, travel like us. That's for sure. Well, <laughs> we got eighty-two tackle true. boxes, thirty-eight true. rods, and a ridiculous amount of everything. But but they they organize it quite well. I think they really they par it down to whatever they absolutely need. They have the rods behind them, so they learn to cast, knowing that the rods are sticking up and the rod holders behind that's, them and all that's that kind right. of stuff. So you you know we, whoosh, we you and I would catch them <laughs> freaking things right every cast. Would jeez, why do I leave that thing there for? So I've seen them fly fishing out of those things. Oh my God! See, I have no idea on that one. No idea. Speaking of fly fishing, it was nice to see Colin. At, uh, it was so last nice. Week. That was the only, well, not only, that was one of the positives of that trip because we had a lot of negatives of that trip. So Colin <laughs> and Carol, Colin was great to see. We had a good chat with Colin McEwen of the, the new fly fisher, in case anybody's wondering. Uh, fantastic guy. Uh, certainly the highest profile fly angler in this part of the world, no mm-hmm. doubt about it. Great mm-hmm. program, by the way. If you ever get a chance to check it out, um, the new fly fisher, some of the most spectacular cinematography in the fishing industry that you'll ever see. Yeah. Uh, let alone great fishing. But uh, we had a chance to spend some time. We had a coffee, uh, spent an hour and a half having coffee with Colin yeah, at yeah, the yeah, event. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Anyways. There's an adventure just outside these walls. It's something you'll hate to leave and can't wait to get back to. It's a place where memories are made and bonds are forged. For some, it's hitting the trails. For others, it's a weekend at the lake. It's a place full of campfires and quality time. This year, take some time to reconnect with friends, family, and nature. No matter what adventures await you, Coleman has the gear you need. Visit ColemanCanada.ca to gear up today. The outside is calling. Answer the call. Back in 2016, Frank and I had a vision to amass the single largest database of musky angling education material anywhere in the world. Our dream was to harness the knowledge of this amazing community and share it with passionate anglers just like you. Thus, the Ugly Pike podcast was born and quickly grew to become one of the top fishing podcasts in North America. Step into the world of angling adventures and embrace the thrill of the catch with the Ugly Pike Podcast. Join us on our quest to understand what makes us different as anglers and to uncover what it takes to go after the infamous fish of 10,000 casts. The Ugly Pike Podcast isn't just about fishing. It's about creating a tight-knit community of passionate anglers who share the same love for the sport. 
through laughter, through camaraderie, and an unwavering spirit of adventure, this podcast will bring people together. Subscribe now and never miss a moment of our angling adventures. Tight lines, everyone. Find Ugly Pike now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you get your podcasts. All right, let's get to our uh, guest uh, welcoming, uh, I think, one of the most interesting guests we've ever had on the show, by the way. I'm just going to go on record right now. Agreed. We don't even know him. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it just... doesn't matter. I read the book, and uh, I got to tell you, this character is uh, is destined to be an outdoor journal radio superstar. Uh, welcome to the program, Sam Lowry. How are you, bud? Good. Thank you, Angelo and Pete. Good morning to both of you guys. Good morning, sir. Uh, thanks for taking the time. First of all, I want to I want to tell the audience that uh, we had a little bit of problem getting you on, not because of you, but because of our schedule last week got all screwed up, and a couple of times we had to postpone. Uh, so we really appreciate you doing this uh, with us. Now, I, I, did I hear right from our producer Dean? You're uh, uh, actually out hunting or on a hunting uh, uh, location right now. Yeah, I came back to uh, enjoy Thanksgiving with my wife's uh, family, and that happens to be in northwest Iowa, where it's just uh, loaded with ringneck pheasants. Nice. Nice. Uh, Just to bring people up to speed, we mentioned it earlier on in the program, but just now that you're here, uh, Sam, aside from being an accomplished author that we're going to talk about here in just a moment, uh, he serves with the Western Regional Directorship for uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, hence out pheasant fishing there's a surprise he got the hunting (laughs) out of hunting yeah (laughs) um served also as the director of conservation for the teller uh, wildlife refugee in western montana nice uh we're no strangers to montana absolutely what a beautiful beautiful state love it uh 21 21 year career with uh, arizona game and fish department and that's Really, the Ooh. genesis of your book, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming. Uh, the book is called An Arizona Game Ranger Remembering the Outlaws. And how aptly titled is that? It's just, it, that just draws you in right there, doesn't it? You say, oh, i got to read this. Uh, so, Sam, first of all, let, let me tell you a little bit uh, about uh, Pete and I, our beliefs. We, um, we've been immersed in the outdoors forever, and we know an, a lot of conservation officers in this part of the world and i've always, and i've interviewed so many of them and i've always maintained um and after reading your book now it's confirmed it's official the most dangerous job on the planet is being in the conservation of wildlife uh there's no doubt in my mind at all uh based on what i uh i read in that book so hats off to you for that my friend <laughs> yeah I've, you know i've, I've heard that uh numerous times throughout my career and I I always kind of challenge that back and say at least when you're you know a wildlife officer and you are expecting perhaps the people you check to be armed you're you're expecting that whereas you think of some of the you know the city police officers and highway patrolmen and troopers that just pull over people that, that necessarily right. aren't expecting that and then it pops up right 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 what about though Sam, what about comparing a conservation officer to a, a SWAT team officer? That's well, got to be. Think you, yeah, I mean, I just, again, I think you're looking at a kind of a highly skilled professional that's dealing with uh, what I would call far worse criminal behavior than those perhaps taking advantage of, of some wildlife opportunities, you know, and the right. The, the trafficking of, of illegal wildlife and things like that uh, at some point perhaps don't hold the same degree of danger as you know drug cartels and and kidnappings and things like that that yeah. SWAT teams are typically called up for yeah yeah and they know going in how bad it is like well, Sam right. doesn't know if he's pulling well, over a guy for and he has a shotgun or a handgun or maybe nothing you know it's not like you, when they go in they but so yeah it's, I'll it's give you an example from personal yeah. experience uh, Sam and Pete uh, I, I used to go into Algonquin Park twice a year with a bunch of guys, pretty rowdy guys. You know, we were young, and, and it's that, you know, once or twice a year you get together with the boys, and there's usually a bit of alcohol involved. And, and, you, and There's you, always a bit of alcohol well, involved. Come I on. Didn't I, I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it. 
But there's usually a bit of alcohol involved, and and we'd always be in the very bowels of Algonquin Park. Like it would take us days of of getting paddling, walking, hiking, carrying. Like we were in the middle of nowhere, you know, and there'd be sometimes some trips we'd have 12, 13, 14 of us in camp. And every once in a while we'd have a CEO pop in unannounced, just pop in. Howdy boys. How you doing? And I often thought, man, this guy has got a set of balls. He's got a set of balls. First of all, I'm sure there was a bit of surveillance involved because he didn't just happen to stumble out of the woods into our camp. He must've, check this out a little bit from from the woods and he knew we were a bunch of rowdy idiots who had probably been drinking that night or whatever the case may be but yet there he was bouncing into camp you know like yeah. that yeah. takes extraordinary <laughs> courage as it far is, as I but it's a delivery thing too and i'm sure sam's going to tell us yeah. that it's all about making a rapport with these people right well, you guys you yeah, know yeah. the ceos that you yeah go ahead sam there's, tell there's us gotta be something that. That. Well, I, you know, in, in, in a case like that where you're you're way out in the booties and, and he happens to just pop up, uh, I can assure you he, he did some homework. That's right. And, and and knew that there wasn't, you know, a felon in your in your hunting group and probably was doing just a, a, a general check. Um, and, and a lot of times when we, we would work undercover and, and look for, let's just say, I think there's one of the stories in the book about working a, a, a dove hunt, which in Arizona, you know, draws the masses. I mean, 50,000 people will come over from Southern California to hunt doves for a weekend. Well, in that case, you kind of target those people that have, you know, popped one too many tops and they're a little loud and you're going, there's the ones that are going to do it. And you just kind of uh, sit to the side and, and watch them for a while. And then you you go in and do what you need to do. Wow. I, 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 the courage is incredible as far as I'm concerned, man. You guys are uh, hats off to you. Sam, do you have as many, just in general, is there as many feel-good stories as there is criminal stories? You know what I mean? Like when you pull people over and then they just... Yeah. Is there a oh, I can. I, I tell you, the the feel good stories far outweigh the, the bad guys. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you know. You look at the the general contacts you're making as a conservation officer. You're, you're you know you're out there for public safety and and making sure people are enjoying the time that they're spending in the woods. And a lot of times you're you're helping them out. You're pointing them in the right direction. Uh, anything from helping them find a lost hunter or lost kid to to uh, fixing their vehicle. I mean, yeah, it's it, 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 it's a, not a, a rare thing, but let's just say that the bad guys certainly don't dominate, you know, your, your, your time in the field. Okay. Yeah. That's a great point because, um, I, I mean, the majority of our exposure to COs is limited to what we've seen on TV or read in books, et cetera. Um, one thing I did notice, especially from the television uh, e exposure that the CEOs are getting in the various programs about CEOs, is that their demeanor is a little different than a traffic cop, right? Like you guys, you guys are always, they always do seem to be extra friendly. You always seem to be a little more jovial, whereas, you know, a, a street cop, uh, a, that especially a young street cop, tends to have a bit of a swagger that he'd like to display is always on display like a bit of a peacock you guys don't do that from what i can tell you guys are, are and maybe that's part maybe that's your your mo maybe that's how you get uh, on the good side not knowing the situation that you're walking into um but you have a different demeanor than regular cops would yeah and you know you could you can tell when you've been in the field long enough and you make a contact and you have a person with an attitude, you can glean that quickly. And, and let's just say you do find one with an attitude, some uh, resentment for authority or the uniform you're wearing. Well, yeah, I'm not handing them an ice cream cone. Uh, I'm gonna just strengthen it up a little bit and let yeah. them know I'm there to take care of whatever issue I'm there for. But conversely, you, you beat the person just on the shores of a lake fishing with their kid and you, you make the contact pleasant. You right. want that kid to remember that CEO right. was, hey, that was kind of a neat experience. Yeah, 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 for sure. You know what though, Ange, 
<clears throat> and Sam will probably uh, agree with this somewhat. I think the pol- the common police officer, the traffic officer, not they're they're very common around. We see them all the time, and they probably get a lot more shit thrown at them than yeah, a guy maybe. like Sam. You know maybe. what I mean? Because they see the people. Uh, yeah. People hate cops for some reason. Like I don't know why. Even yeah. people that aren't true criminals Authority, hate like cops. Like what what the hell? They're they're doing the best they can, and and they just pull that attitude right off the bat. Here, here's my license. Here, what'd you pull me over for? You know what I mean? It probably happens all the time. They don't get to see uh, meet up with a CEO. Well, these a lot of these people will never see a CEO in their life, right? But right. but they have this attitude. Of about them and, and like Sam says when they have that attitude you know the cop's going to put it back at them oh, right? for, for sure. sure and, so, and justifiably sure. so, so yeah. uh, Sam here in Canada and I don't know how it is in the US um, I'm told I was told a long time ago that COs are the only law enforcement um, branch that don't need a warrant to go into a person's tent or his cabin or his truck or or his duffel bag or whatever it is. Like, you guys don't need, like, nobody can pull the warrant trick on you where you're out in the middle of uh, some place and you say, okay, open up that uh, cooler. They can't say, well, where's your warrant? Because you guys don't need one. Is that true? It is, it is with this caveat that there has to be some kind of a probable cause or reasonable belief that uh, that warrants that 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 uh, looking. Uh, in other words, if if I saw a guy swerve through a red light and I pulled him over for a traffic violation, which which wildlife officers can do. Um, I, and there's no expectation that he's been hunting or fishing. Oh. I don't have the right to go into his truck. Okay. But the person that's out there leaving a lake with 19 rods hanging out of the back of his truck, and I pull him over, now I can look in his ice chest. I have a, a reasonable suspicion that, that there's probably some fish or game in his possession. So, yeah, we have a greater leeway, but it's certainly not and it's one that should never be abused. Right. Because uh, mm-hmm. it gives the wildlife officer that little tiny step up when it's warranted. Yeah. Yeah, I hear. Oh, and, and listen, I, I, I threw that out there because I think – I think of all of the uh, enforcement officers, the conservation officers, the one that should have a little more leeway only because of the environment that you guys work in versus a regular um, officer. So yeah. um, let's get into yeah. some of the stories. Cause yeah. I think that's what everybody's waiting for. I think the audience uh, is going to love this. First of all, once again, uh, the book is called uh, uh, the days uh, as an Arizona game ranger. Um, Remembering the outlaws. Remembering the outlaws. <laughs> I cool. love that. That's I so love cool. that. Um, before we get into the stories, though, just give us a little bit about the book. How long did it take you to, to put this together? It was kind of funny. I, you know, I, I often was found telling stories to family and friends about my my days as a game and fish officer. And routinely, I'd be told, why don't you write that down, Dad? You know, you're not going to be around forever. And you're starting yes. to decompose at a rapid rate. <laughs> so, uh, I started putting pen to paper. Now, here's a funny thing. I I was on another podcast where they asked me this question. How did you find the time to write it? And I made the comment that when I went to all these meetings and my buddies were down at the watering hole, I, being the good guy, I went up to my room and wrote the book and avoided such uh, lures as the watering goal. And, and they called foul on that, right? Away. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do the same, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So now I, that just took, you know, you'd sit down with a pen and paper and you start, start thinking about the stories. And, and then I had still many contacts, you know, that I could rely on for some information that I was lacking. And, and little by little, I just started putting it together and really with the intent of leaving a legacy of, of what I did for my kids to enjoy and, and know. Um, and it's kind of blossomed a little bit. I mean, it's this thing. That I had a guy tell me the other day he was flying to Alaska to go fishing, and the guy sitting next to him was reading the book. Oh, wow. <laughs> thought, well, that's How that's cool. cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. How long did it take? From start to it finish? probably took me about six months to okay. to get it all put together and edited, and then my daughter is a self-publishing 
uh, uh, site that she did. And then my uh, other daughter, I have four, and, and the other one did the little pencil sketches in it. So it's kind of a little family nice. project. Nice. Excellent. Nice. Now, there are 29 Excellent. stories or short stories uh, within the book. Uh, I'm assuming that would be, we could call those chapters, uh, although each yeah. story does have a, a bit of a break in it as well. And most of them are dealing with poaching, wildlife violations, that kind of thing. We can't go through them all, but there are some here that uh, that we've got highlighted that we'd like you to maybe to expand on if you could. Uh, the first one that we've got is uh, the Roosevelt Fish Market story. Uh, tell the audience a little bit about that, would you? Well, there was a, a tip that came in that uh, uh, gave us the information that a guy might be catching way too many fish and selling them which was against the law, any commercialization of fish or wildlife um, in this lake in central Arizona. And so they, they were looking for an undercover officer to go camp and, and hopefully get to know this individual and see if see if uh, we could determine whether or not he was doing that. And I had just gotten to Arizona, so a lot of times people, they, they, they look for someone that's not well known to work undercover cases. And I let my hair down a little bit, grew up half a beard, and looked kind of shabby. And before long, I, I was able to actually uh, get to know the, the suspect, uh, camped near him, uh, ultimately offered him a couple of six packs of beer, and he took me out fishing a couple times. And, and uh, you know, I was right there with him. <laughs> Sometimes I'm thinking, you know, what in the heck am I doing? Uh, he's talking about, you know, if this game and fish officers who I knew in the area, they come by, uh, you know, let me do the talking, you know, and, and, uh, cause every once in a while they can be real, real assholes is what he said. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting there with him going, well, you got one in your boat. Oh my God. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but it was funny that, that one ended up being, he was just, I mean, he was catching a lot of fish. There were some violations. Uh, having to do with method of take, but he was never selling fish. So I, I was able to confirm that, no, he, he needed a few citations, which they ultimately got. Uh, the funny part was a, a month or so after I had left and I was back in that general area patrolling in full uniform, oh, and no. I went to a little gas station to get a pop or some chips or something. And I was at the counter, I look over, and, and here he is. I call oh. him Scruffy. Oh, uh, my God. Did he recognize you? Did, did not recognize no. He looked wow. right at me. I was, hello, officer. I, hey, how you doing? Wow. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> that is, that is funny. So Sam. they know. So, sorry, Ange. So on that little sting or whatever, you guys got some charges and done in that. When all is said and done, you leave the scene, and that guy never knew ever that you were a CEO to begin with. They just somehow got some evidence somehow. You know, how do they get the evidence, or how do you prove uh, you uh, did it? You know, in, in that case, he he was told. You know, okay, you, you've been you've been had. Okay, okay. And, uh, the guy the guy that was with you was a plant, and okay. and here's what we got. Because they they had there was some marijuana stuffed up into a shotgun barrel <laughs> in the front of his boat, and then, you know, I told him to get rid of that, and make the place safe, and oh, so wow. yeah, they they had to say. That, that guy in that white van with California plates was an officer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sam, that I, makes sense. I don't know whether um, th that story connects with this or whether maybe one of the other chapters in the book, but did you ever run into anybody who you got the report that they were doing something nefarious uh, in wildlife, but you, you infiltrated them and you find out that that they really didn't know they were doing anything wrong. In other words, this is not a criminal. This is just a regular dude who maybe just doesn't understand the law, doesn't think it's a big deal. Like, like in other words, are they, they're not all just perps that want to uh, rape and pillage wildlife, are they? Well, let me just say this. If, if there's an undercover officer working, working you, uh, there, there's, probable cause that you you're doing something wrong uh, the guy that we just talked about was probably the closest to what you're describing right. that you know he wasn't a real bad guy but uh, for the most part and I, I always say this that you know the, the average wildlife violation 
is not something where someone purposely set out to violate. They, they're what we call opportun, opportunist poachers. They were out, you know, to shoot a, uh, a, a, a white tail and a big mule deer buck came by that they just couldn't resist. And they pulled the trigger and they made the wrong decision to try to cover it up. But, you know, are they the real bad guy that's, that's uh, you know, taking, you know, unguided hunters and taking wildlife across state lines or, or international borders? You know, uh, the real bad guys, uh, they know exactly what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And it's a small percentage, but they, yeah, there's no doubt. They're there to to uh, really do damage to the resource without any re- remorse at all. Yeah. Sam, yeah. those guys, I just texted my wife in case anybody's watching us tonight, because my wife works for the police department, criminal records over here. And they have what they call frequent flyers. They show up all the time <laughs> on the list year by, after you're laughing, because you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. When, in the world of conservation, are the same thing happening out there? Is there always these guys that yeah. show up and show up? Because the ones you're talking about are the badasses. And, you know, one guy that accidentally screws up, he probably will never do it again. Do they always show up more and more and more all the time? Yeah, in fact, it's funny you mentioned it because I, I, in preparation for this interview, I called a friend of mine who still works for Arizona Game and Fish Department, and he he referred to me. He says, "You remember the such and such a case that we did, you know, 20 years ago, and you know, we we gave them some pretty hefty fines, and they lost their licenses for a few years." He says their kids are doing the same no. thing. Now. Oh my God! Eh? No. Just unreal. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah, he says, here we are doing that, and it's a whole <sighs> suite of new officers catching the offspring. That's so they, they pass wow. it on. That's crazy. Wow. Think That's about that. Totally what did insane. you inherit? Oh, but I you know, know how to poach deer. You but, know. but isn't that something? Because, I mean, let's take the wildlife aspect out of it. And, you know, uh, professional criminals, they do. They hand it down to generations that, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that we've got this under control, Sam? In, in other words, do you think that the punishment fits the crime in in terms of game and wildlife conservation you no know, no i yeah. still don't i i think um what what's happened and slowly evolved and i don't i'm not really quite sure how it works uh, up in in your provinces but within the states a lot of times you know wildlife violations fall to the county level or or they're held by the county prosecutor in the area where the violation occurred. Mm. And those typically are, are not high priority cases. Those, those uh, prosecutors are, you know, uh, trying to prosecute rapists and, you know, murderers right. and homicides, you know, those kinds of things. And so a lot of times you work your tail off trying to, to make a case that ultimately gets handed to a county prosecutor that in many times is just plea bargain down right. and cases are, you know, charges are dismissed and, and what fines are levied are, are somewhat minimal. Now I will say that there are certain movements to add more felonies to some of the wildlife violations. Again, that's going to be used as a plea bargain chip to, to knock it from a, a felonious uh, violation to a misdemeanor. So where the where I see the the bane I guess thrust of starting to 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 whack some of these violators is the civil aspects and the loss of their hunting licenses and and in in the states there's a wildlife compact that if you revoke somebody for taking an elk unlawfully in Arizona uh, 48 other states honor that revocation. And that really hurts that person. Now they're sure. they're done for you know three to five to maybe ten years, um, and so I think you're seeing the civil penalties um, that in many cases game and fish commissions take up on against the violator uh, are are doing more damage to persuade people not to do this than the criminal outcome. Hmm. Yeah, well, th- th- I was going to say my thoughts on this is is it I would assume that. If it was a somewhat law-abiding citizen, it was a mistake, it took that elk at the wrong time or whatever, he gets his hand slapped and he listens. But a true poacher, 
Would they care if they have a license or not? Do they really? It's, it's, I think it's a really good point. I, I can tell you there was one guy, it's, 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 it's in the book. Um, he, he just was a, an absolute bad, bad dude. And, and I actually was horseback doing some uh, wildlife surveys in a real remote part of Arizona. And I found these, uh, well, I found ravens and I found some bald eagles moving around a canyon that would indicate possibly something was dead. And I found these big treble hooks. I mean, they were, you know, an inch, inch and a half uh, wide with meat scraps and they were all tied with uh, metal leaders. And this guy was trying to catch anything he possibly could. I could see where he caught a lion. I could see where he caught an eagle. Wow. And, and I mean, there was no regard. But we ended up, uh, you know, catching the guy, which was a lengthy investigation. Uh, it wasn't six months later that we heard he was doing similar activities in New Mexico. So I, I think you're right. I think they're, they're going to go further and deeper into the woods. They probably learned their lesson not to tell anybody about it, mm -hmm. and they're they're still up to the old old uh, old tricks of the trade, which is is a bad thing. That's it just uh, it's you, the, mind, you, the things that you must have seen in your career. Just uh, I mean, we're just brushing through a couple of them real quick here, but I'm sure every one of them has got an incredible story uh, behind it. Uh, talk to us about the uh, the other one I've got listed here in your book. You you uh, were called a coyote son of a bitch uh, <laughs> is the title of the chapter. Talk to us about that. <laughs> That one was, I will admit, that was one of my, my funnier ones I look back on. The, the, uh, the story really centers around a, a couple of, of mountain lion hunters uh, that were, were also running bears with hounds. Um, and, and they had taken a bear illegally and left the, the, uh, the carcass. They skinned the bear, and, and, and all this was way out in the boonies again. Um, and I had an informant that kind of filled me in on the general location and some of the specifics, but I had no reason to go to them and, 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 you know, accuse them of being involved with this bear without possibly, you know, uh, uh, I guess, exposing my informant. And so I just kept thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Well, I had picked up a bunch of nine millimeter casings from the crime scene and, and removed some of the slugs from the bear, which, oh, by the way, when I reached my hand in, uh, was about a four day old carcass just uh, wiggling with maggots. Oh. It was really a, a sight to see. And, and when, you, when you walk up on a skin bear, you got to first make sure it's not a human. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. Anyway, the, so ah. I finally just put the, the two of them in the vicinity. They were out lion hunting again. And I just made a stop just to visit with them and noticed a nine millimeter pistol sitting on the dashboard. Okay. And I, I, in just small chatter, just talk, said, hey, we're, we're thinking about switching over to 9 millimeters. You know, how do you think that gun shoots? And he said, well, you shoot it. What do you think? So I, I took the pistol and shot it uh, several times, all the time watching where the empties went, and had our little conversation, and they left. And I collected the empties sent them into the crime lab with the ones that I collected the crime scene. Wow. And the, the rest was a knock on the door with a search warrant. Oh, that's awesome. That is good thinking, Sam. I love that. <laughs> and he did. He called me a coyote son of a bitch. <laughs> no kidding. I would have too. <laughs> no, that's great. Did you ever get busted? Did you ever get busted on, on one of these undercover deals where you've been, you know, let's say you've been, you infiltrated this camp for a few days and somebody recognized you or somehow busted you on it yeah there, and i don't know it was uh it was one that we were working with some illegal bear activity and we ended up with the the bad guy we actually uh spent the, the night in his house and that was, that's that's another whole story and uh when when he finally did get busted we we didn't get him on that particular event but down the road, he got busted, and they took his his uh, kind of like phone or address book. And my undercover name in that case was Sam LaRue, 
and they found that. And then next to it was Game Warden. Holy Sam Lowe. shit. Yeah, so it, uh, well, it's a good thing he didn't know that when I was there because he was kind of a bad dude. Wow. wow. But you never got busted like right in the game itself in the middle of a game. Did, no, did anybody... you you re, you did your you did your rehearsal in and in, excuse me in in, uh, in many cases and I didn't do a great deal of undercover work but knowing that the question would come up you know hey you're not a game warden are you or you know I think yeah. you're a game warden yeah, yeah, yeah. well you're, you know what are you talking about Jesus what would I be doing that for I mean get ready to respond yeah, yeah. and practice yeah. that just like yeah. you would your golf swing. Yeah, we've yeah. got a friend of ours. Uh, his son is was an undercover uh, police officer, and I had I had you know several discussions with him while he was doing these jobs on just because you guys have got to be we we civilians have no idea what that would feel like, but you got to be in a different space when when you take on that persona, that character that you're portraying. You're almost on that line, are you not? Like, you have to be so good at your job that some people might look at you and say, gee, Sam, I don't know, I'm a little worried about your behavior right now because you, you're convincing me that you're one of them. I've, I had this discussion with him, I'm talking about Tim. I know exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, he says, yeah, he says, uh, I lost myself so many times and I had to really work hard at bringing myself back out of it. Have you experienced that? I didn't. I never worked that deep. But I knew undercover officers that did, and th there's no doubt. I mean, you oh. had you, and in one, one case, I know there was, excuse me, there was a couple of uh, undercover officers that were involved with some illegal reptile trafficking, and I mean, and they they got into some really deep, deep illegal activity, and and you know, it's just a it's a different mindset. Oh. And I, you know, they, they, those, those men and women that do that, uh, you know, they're not even part of the team. You, you don't see them at meetings. You don't see them at, you know, workshops. I mean, they're, they're undercover and it's a, I salute them. I mean, it's a heck of a, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they got to literally transform themselves into the same dirt ball they're trying to catch. Yep. Yep. Yep, for sure. Uh, it's that's a scary thought. For how do sure. they how do they choose these undercover agents, Sam? So you got in in a state of Arizona, they have a you know a, a something heavy duty reptile thing like that. Yeah. How do they go about choosing <laughs> these guys? Well, I think, yeah, I think that early on, you know, you have an interest. Let's just say you have an interest in wildlife, and and, and it, for me, when I started out, I had no desire to be a, a, a game warden. I wanted to be a waterfowl biologist. You know, I wanted to study ducks, geese, and swans, and and I wanted to work on a refuge. And all of a sudden, I found myself in the enforcement arena, which I later recognized is probably one of the most valuable tools in the wildlife manager's bag is enforcement. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think as you go into that field, you know, there's a certain spark in you that says, you know, I kind of want to kind of want to work undercover. Yeah. And a lot of that time you probably get right out of the police academy and most of your, you know, colleagues don't even know you're in it. And, right. yeah, uh, yeah. You, yeah, you can't you can't uh, a chance. Uh, people knowing you when when you're working for some of these really bad guys, no different than I'm sure with regular narcotics agents and things like yeah, that. Yeah. They're, they're they're a different set of people. For mm -hmm. sure, for, for sure. sure. Uh, Interesting. I, I have to ask you about one more uh, uh, chapter in the book. The uh, the mud puddle story is fascinating. That's a good one. That, that one one. one that one is absolutely fascinating. Share that with the audience, would you? Yeah, that one is, was an interesting deal, I, and it kind of quick. It's a long story, but to make it short, there was a, a slew of elk poaching that occurred up in the district I was responsible for, uh, just shot and left, shot and left, shot and left, and and no leads. You never never could find out any good tips, any good leads. It was happening at night. It was looked likely a, an automatic weapon of some kind. Uh, but this went on for months and months, and I mean probably 20-plus elk got tipped over wow. from what we could tell was the same person. 
And then uh, one time I was coming home from a, a little evening uh, of, I believe, country western dancing where I had no alcohol. No. And none. <laughs> uh, but just enough to put on the John Wayne uniform. Oh, boy. This guy and say, I, I saw a spotlighter up on this one ridge, and I'm going to go back. It might be my bad guy. And uh, anyway, I went back out, and I thought I had the guy. I had him turned off this one, and I could hear shots, and I and I could uh, had him go off this one two track road that I thought was a dead end road, and I went down there to see if he went down it. There was a big mud puddle. I got out of my game and fish truck, and I went up with a flashlight, and I looked at the mud puddle to see if a vehicle had driven through, and and no, no, no one, no, there's no tracks going out, there's no bubbles in the water. No, I, I, I guess I lost him. And it was about six months later where I got a call from one of our investigators saying that they had uh, a narcotics officer up in Holbrook, Arizona, that had an individual in, in, incarcerated in jail there that mentioned he was involved with a bunch of elk poaching that the game and fish officers you know, never caught. And, and he was in there for a homicide. He was in there for some kind of a, a charge of, of murder in New Mexico. And they just asked me, you want to go interview the guy and, and uh, see if you can straighten out if he's the one. And so I, I did. I drove up there, and the guy comes out in his orange jump shoot and walking down a hall into a little little room where I could interview him. And, and I, I just... She looked at him and said, so you, you know something about the elk poaching? He says, yeah, that was all me. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, I just I was high on meth all the time, and I just like to kill shit. <laughs> and he, he looked me in the eye and said, I'll tell you one thing. He goes, you got, a, you got a game warden out there with angel wings on. And I said, oh, really? What, what, what's that about? And he said, one night, one of your guys was right on top of me, and uh, I was higher than a kite. And I went through this one little road and parked, and I had made up my mind that if he came through this road, I was going to spray him. He had an Uzi. Oh. And he said, the guy got out with a flashlight, went down and looked at this mud puddle, and for some reason, oh. he never went on. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> wow. That must have given you goosebumps, oh Sam. Oh, my God. Like, I still get it. Yeah, you know, when I tell you that. And I, you know, I looked at him, and I went, well, should I tell him, you know, since yeah. that was me? Oh, did you wow. tell him or no? No, no, no. I never did. I just, oh, my God. Oh, I, when I was reading man. that same thing, I had goosebumps. I, I could only try and, and, and imagine what was going through your head when you're looking at this guy, yeah. you know, in the eyes, hey. and he's telling you that he's he almost pulled the trigger on you, but not knowing that it was you. My yeah. God, I'm, that's, that's bone chilling. Absolutely that bone insane. chilling. Yeah, was, that's a good story, Sam. Oh, my God. <laughs> Glad you're on the podcast, buddy. You never went through that puddle. <laughs> yeah, it's fun, to, fun, fun to tell. I'm glad I'm alive to tell you. We interrupt this program to bring you the much-anticipated bonus code for the latest Fishing Canada giveaways. This week's code is RECORD. Not record, right, Dean? RECORD. That is R-E-C-O-R-D in all caps. Just type that in the bonus code section of the contest and receive 100 free entries towards all of our current giveaways. For those of you who aren't entered yet, what are you waiting for? Head over to FishingCanada.com while you listen to the rest of this episode. Click Contests and sign up for all the latest Fishing Canada giveaways. And now, back to the episode. Yeah, well, no I was just going to say that. You know, you have got this incredible personality. You're a character. You're, you're an, a, an absolute treat, first of all. Let me just tell you to interview. Uh, but, but more than that, you're just a great all-around nice guy. That's the image that you portray. And I'm just wondering if there's any younger folks out there who might be looking at getting involved in the, you know, uh, wildlife conservation uh, end of it as a CEO. Is there any anything you can pass on to them about the way they should be thinking about their future career and how they should 
behave in that uh, in that CEO position that has stood you well, by the way, obviously. Uh, any advice you can give them? You know, that's, uh, I really appreciate that question because I, I think as I – uh, have, I just retired in June after 43 years in the wildlife My field. My God. And, and I, what, probably the last three years or maybe four or five years, I, I really made it a passion to, to, to leave uh, a, a, an imprint on that younger generation. And, in fact, just last week I taught a class at the University of Montana to, to about 120 college kids on careers in wildlife. And one of the things I tell them is it, it's a long journey. Everybody thinks that you're going to get into this field and whatever, retire in 20 years, or it might take you five years to get a job. And, but when it's all said and done, you look back on it, and, and I still carry a, a, a significant amount of passion for wildlife conservation, and you can do that too. You can begin this journey knowing it's going to be a long journey and a diversified journey and, and absolutely get it done. And with us, as I said earlier, with us baby boomers uh, decomposing at a rapid rate, there's going to be plenty of jobs. So, you know, you, you're yeah. going to have a good time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I always just impart that with them, that it's a, it's a long journey, slow down, walk to the dance, don't run to it. And you're going to find yourself that you, you not only pick meaningful work, you pick fun work. And it's, it's, a, it's a great career. Don't ever look back and charge forward and get it done. That's what I tell them. Nice. Slow, nice. long and slow. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, you guys mentioned uh, law enforcement earlier on. Is there any crossover between the two branches? In other words, do you get... Um, do you see regular police officers looking at your career that you've had and say, you know, I might want to maybe make the move over to wildlife enforcement as opposed to what I'm doing or the other way around. Do any of your colleagues have any, any of your colleagues gotten so high from the adrenaline rush of, of doing what you did and say, you know, I'd like to apply this to maybe people as opposed to animals. Is there a crossover at all? You know, I, I don't know real recent uh, examples, but I do know that early on in my career, uh, a, a police officer, particularly a highway patrolman, probably made twice as much as a game warden. And oh, okay. it was money driven for some of these young people. They, right. they had whatever a little family and, and a lot of them chose to go, you know, to the, the highway patrol side really for money. Hmm. The ones that carried the passion, the ones that had, I was born and raised in the outdoors, and I get my batteries charged for being outdoors, yeah. they don't change. And yeah, I rub, ran into many uh, police officers that wish they would have gone that route, and, and you know, oh, you got the dream job. You know, and, and you could have too. You could have too. Yeah. Just pursue it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good way Sam, to have, you ever, have you ever worked in Canada or cross-pollinated with our Canadian MNRs or anything like that? Yeah, I was going to mention early on. I, when I was uh, probably in my early 30s, my wife and three-month-old daughter, Nicole, took an assignment with the Canadian Wildlife Service in Grand Prairie, Alberta, oh. to ban ducks. Nice. <laughs> and, and I went up there, and we stayed at a little place called an Igloo Inn, and I banned a <laughs> duck seven days a week. I think, uh, by the way, know. by the way, I think I stayed there. I'm serious. <laughs> I think I stayed there. I'm not kidding you. Oh, good. There, the worst part about it was I had, I had two interns, one from Canada and one from California. And right next to the Igloo Inn was a wiggle bar. <laughs> Where do you think my interns hung out? <laughs> and, and in any event, I... Uh, I, I finished that, and then later on in my career, I was staffed to the North American Wetlands Council, uh, which funds wetland projects in Mexico, U.S., and Canada. And that gave me a great opportunity to visit. We funded projects in British Columbia, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And then uh, those are the ones that I went to see. 
And then just recreation-wise, I spent uh, 11 days uh, up in northern Quebec hunting caribou a few years oh, ago. Oh, nice. You know, and, and I, I'll just say this, that I, I just love the, the Canadian people. Uh, I look at our neighbors above us and just say, boy, anytime I could get up there and spend time with you folks, uh, I, I would welcome it. So I was always very welcome myself. Nice. Wow. Nice to hear, for sure. Thank um, you. We, uh, I mentioned earlier on, Pete and I are no strangers to Montana. We've done uh, quite a bit of work there. I think we've shot, I'm going to say, a half a dozen episodes in the state of Montana, and it's a pretty special place as well. When they, uh, when you read in their uh, travel brochures, you know, big sky country, you don't understand it until you visit Montana mm -hmm. and then you all of a sudden it just hits you. Yeah. I know why they call this big sky because I don't know what it is, but it looks different when you're in the, in the boonies in Montana and you look up, it's gorgeous. you're, you're, it's you're so on gorgeous. another planet. Yeah. Uh, it, it is spectacular. And, uh, what a great place to work. What a great backdrop to do what you've done for 40 some yeah. odd years, man. Uh, good for you. Yeah. It's it was a neat place to end up. I, like I see, you know, I spent 23 years in Arizona and ended up in Montana. Oh. And now the wife and I are probably going to go just like the Sandhill Cranes do and go winter in Arizona and come back. <laughs> <in the laughs> nice, summer. nice. Is there anything better than that? Hey, Sam, here, yeah. give me, it's going to be a, one or the other answer. It's going to be either legal mm. or illegal. I'm going to tell Sam about mm. our, our uh, Montana. Okay. So we're That's driving along. These guys got the horse trailer. They got this pickup truck. They got dogs on the outside of this truck. And it's just the typical Montana. It's awesome. These it's guys are great. We're, yeah, we're, ranch we're, guys. We're, we're working yeah. on a ranch, a so working ranch. We're driving down this old dirt road. And uh, all of a sudden, the brakes pound on the brakes. And all of a sudden, within seconds, crack, you hear this rifle go off. Uh, out the window, like the guy just stopped. Pulled out on his on his land, and he shot a badger because they because of all the cows or whatever like that. Is that like illegal or is that they can they do that down in the U.S.? Well, uh, shooting from a vehicle is not legal. Okay, right. Okay, we knew yeah. that. <laughs> but but I mean, you find me a, a, a rancher's truck out in Montana that doesn't have a weapon. Exactly. In it, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be surprised. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, Sam, that he walked uh, at least 100 yards out there. No scope, I don't think, on the gun. He just popped that thing one shot right in the head. It was the most <laughs> incredible thing I've ever seen. We still didn't know what was going on. Until because he people, cause until he walked out there and picked this thing up and walked back, we had no idea yeah, what he had done. Never, never said a word. Never said a word. And walked back, just badgers. They're they're not good for cattle boys. Threw it in the back of the truck, <laughs> and the dogs ripped at it. And it was just a, it was unreal. It was it was pretty awesome actually. See this. So. Just remind me what a great experience that was. Oh eh? God! Oh, All those stories we have like that. God, we were on horseback far far longer than we had anticipated. And I'll tell you what, I had a, got a whole new respect for them cowboys yeah, who. Boys, uh, yeah who go up in the mountains and try and bring cattle in in the spring. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Just being on that horse for two or three days, it's murder, man. Murder. <laughs> I got another question for you, Sam. We'll go back to just fish and wildlife in general. So in Canada here, if we see somebody creating an, an infraction, we're to call either tips MNR or crime stoppers. Two numbers. One's, one's the MNR and one's the police. Most of, I mean, I don't know about what's like in the U.S. In Canada, in Ontario, where we are, you're probably not going to see a conservation officer. There's so far, a few and far between, it's ridiculous. I know what your answer is going to be to this, but what if you know, they say, okay, sorry, sir, we'll take care of it, and you see this still going on, and nobody's showing up and showing up. Should we approach these idiots and say, dude, you're, you're snagging fish. Dude, you're being, doing something illegal. Uh, why are you doing this or whatever? I've called the cops on you. Should we approach them? I've never done it, but I've called the cops a couple times, but I've never done that. What's your opinion on that? Well, you got to kind of follow your own gut. My, my immediate response is, no, no, don't you, right. don't you cross that line. You never know how nutty they are. You know, I mean, even though you'd love to go down there and put hurt bumps all over their head, <laughs> you, just, you just don't. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. hopefully that persistence and, and repetitive calls to the officer will ultimately get, get he or she out there. 
And uh, yeah, I just would would uh, suggest don't don't take that step and get yourself involved. You're right not on. getting paid for that. Yeah, I figured that was your answer. It just uh, we it, just, it gets you so irate when you see something oh. going on like that. You know what I mean? And you know nothing's going to be done about it, and it just it, it kills you. That's so. the one time you know we. That's the one time we all want to be COs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I guess a really important point there though is. I run into it all the time where, and I just throughout my career where, where people would know something that went wrong or know that, you know, this guy's, uh, you know, doing something wrong and not telling anybody about it and just flat out putting up with it. And I think that's one message that, that I've tried to make, um, you know, with, with either of these podcasts or any other exchange with the media is enough is enough. And, and just let's, if we don't take our, our own res- responsibility to safeguard the resource, then shame on us. Here, here. And, you know, that, that whatever, that uncle that, you know, shot your wife's deer, t- tell him, I don't agree with that. That's just flat out wrong. Right. Here, here. And I, you know, the, it, it, it requires that. And I, I look at it and say, if, if oh, I, I was going to tell you this, I, I did do a little research on, on a, one case that happened in 2022 in Wyoming that was a very significant fallout on an out-of-state kind of a poaching uh, team, uh, largely getting licenses fraudulently and shooting big game, and, and, and three individuals that, that spent time behind bars. They were fined, you know, in, in excess of $100,000. Uh, they lost nice. their licenses for a long time. But the information came in and began uh, with the, one of the first violations in 2006. And they made the case in 2022. Wow. Think of all the people that knew these bad guys were up to what they were. Wow. And that probably never said anything. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and, and I just challenge, you know, every, every listener on your show that, you know, if, if you know of something like that, one, it might be the piece of the puzzle the officer's looking for. And two, it sends a message that, no, we're, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. Our resource belongs to all of us, not the dirtbag. Wow. Mm-hmm. Very well oh, put, very my well friend. Said. I got one more uh, question for Sam. This one, we, had, we brought up a story earlier on on, this, on the podcast here. And it was about the, I'm sure you heard about the, the walleye fiasco in the tournament where the guy was stuffing weights down the walleye and all that. Well, he got he got recharged with a bunch of other offenses, including five whitetail bucks. In the story, I've never I've never heard any details on this, but they said two or three of those bucks, these are mounted heads. Two or three of those bucks were taken illegally at night. How the hell do they know that? How do the COs know that? How is there is it just through hearsay, through people, through evidence, uh, or, you know, people did, seeing it? Did they interview the guy? I don't know. It's very vague. The, the, yeah, what the we story. Have is very vague. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, often, if if they're you know stating something like that, either the the, the perpetrator himself okay. was encouraged to hey, we got you. Tell us the whole story. Right. What right. happened? And okay, that makes through. sense. Because yeah, otherwise, it would be easier. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Sam, you have been way beyond the word generous with your time today. <laughs> if I was in your position, I'd have told us to hit the road uh, oh, 10 right. minutes into this. I got to go ban some ducks somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to remind the folks, the uh, the name of the book is The uh, Arizona Game Ranger Remembering the Outlaws. And it's a fascinating read. If you're into the outdoors, if you're into wildlife, if you're into conservation, uh, this is a must book. I'm saying it's not just a must book. It should become a handbook uh, because it gives you some great insights into what's going on there. We take it for granted. You know, you go fishing, you go hunting, everything's wonderful. The birds are tweeting, everything's right. green. As one, well, how the hell do you think that happens with people like Sam? That's how. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. appreciate it so much and uh, want to thank you. How can uh, people reach out to you? Is there a website? Is there some place they can get more information on you? Yeah. Well, it, it's funny. My, my daughter, who's kind of my media manager, told me to sign up a, an Instagram account. Right. And, and, I, and I, ha- I bought my wife an Instapot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as I understand it, it's, 
uh, at sam.lowry, L-A-W-R-Y. Perfect. And then it's got a link in there because there's also, I, I did an audio book on the same book. Oh, nice. Cool. So, cool. And, and so you can get it that way. And I've, I've had other people just say they Googled Sam Lowry and that book comes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my friend, uh, hats off to you. Uh, I'm just uh, sorry that you retired. It would be nice <laughs> to know that you're still out there uh, protecting uh, game and wildlife. Oh, I, I will. I, I can never lay down that, uh, let's just say, visual opportunity. I catch a bad guy. Uh, he's got the wrong guy watching him. Nice. And, uh, nice. And if you guys are ever in Montana, uh, you have my contact information. Absolutely. Uh, let, let's hook up and go shoot a blue grouse or something. Oh, beautiful. On that horseback. Awesome. <laughs> no, on horseback. horseback. We can do that. We can do that. Awesome. All right, my friend. Thanks, you have a great day. Thank you very much for joining right. us. Thanks, Andrew and Pete, and uh, thanks, Dean, a bunch. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Uh, Sam Lowry. Ooh, what a character. Fa- I, I knew it. as fascinating yeah. as I knew he yeah, was going to be. Yeah, I knew he was going to be. Just reading the stories, <laughs> the look of Sam. He's just got that storytelling the, you know, aura about him. The so. texture in the stories, the, the way he told the stories, the way they've been put on paper, it, it like you're there. Yeah. You're actually experiencing yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I urge, I'm, I'm not kidding you, uh, Grab the book. If you get a chance, now that I know the audio uh, Oh, hell yeah. Guys out. like me that don't read too well, you know. I, I, I wish I could have asked them. Yeah, you don't read too well. You, you <laughs> read pictures. Uh, I wish I could have asked them, and, and maybe we'll find out. But uh, through Dean, um, it, wouldn't it be great if uh, if he was narrating it with that that great well, sure voice that he's it's got? It's got to be. Usually oh, that's what they do with audio books, man, right? That would be the best. As a rule. So. Well, a lot of times they they bring they hire you know, up somebody, yeah. But Ham Sam's got the voice that he has to oh, he oh, has to do that. God, that'd so. be fascinating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great read and great show, man. Uh, we went way uh, over time, uh, but what a great! Uh, I guarantee you, you know, people have stayed right with Sam's interview right to the end. <laughs> guarantee it. Uh, it's a, it's so awesome. That uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, the story that Pete was alluding to, we talked about it earlier on the program, is on FishingCanada.com. Is our all all of the we we love putting up poaching stories. By the way, yeah, uh, oh, we yeah. are not uh, ashamed of putting up their names, uh, addresses, if we could get them. Because I think the more we expose these uh, people that knowingly break the rules in game of wildlife, the quicker we can shorten that list uh, that's obviously out there now. So. Um, Go check it out. It's all at fishingcanada.com while you're there. Go to the store, the shop.fishingcanada.com will get you there. And uh, while you're there, go into the contest. Hey, why not contest? win something, too? Come on now. And Thank maybe you, even check out uh, our Outdoor Journal Radio podcast network. Hello. You yeah, if you haven't listened to the other shows yet, uh, there's some good stuff there, too. We were almost getting uh, too many uh, little side uh, shows going on. We might be able to start making money here one day. Thank you. Yeah. I was hoping you'd say that. I'm yeah. giving a hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the entire crew, uh, Vova, Nick, Dean over there. Come uh, on now. Michael. Peter Bowman. I'm Angelo Viola. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time.